Okay, a very special piece coming your way right now on OTB AM and Andy Lee is with me in studio. How are you, Andy? Very good, on. So you were up uh, in Belfast recently chatting to Donald McRae and uh, a couple of the, the characters from in Sunshine or in Shadow, How Boxing Brought Hope in the Troubles. One of those characters uh, is Jerry Story. Mm. So you, you, were, you were up there, you were, you were chatting to a few of these people, and what did the likes of, of Jerry have to say, I guess, being a, a little bit removed from the subject matter of, of this? It came about, uh, like... Don McRae is, like, you, we all know what, how, like how high he's held in terms of sports writing and his boxing books are some of the best books on boxing that's ever been written, that, like Dark Trade, In a Man's World. Um, Dark, Dark Trade was the first book I ever read, really, and it um, really opens your eyes to the darker side of the boxing world and some of the characters that were in it then and the same people still exist now. But he had done... Messaged me and said, Andy, would you have a read of this book? Um, maybe provide, provide a blurb for it. And I was, you know, I was, I was honoured actually to be even asked by him to read it. So, read the book um, before anyone had a chance to read it, and I was blown away by it. You know, and one of the things that struck me was I'd, I'd known Jerry Story my whole my whole life really in boxing in Ireland. He's in the stadium every week, and. I had no idea of all of this detail about him and all the things that he had done. The inboxing and outside of boxing and, and around the troubles and it's it's remarkable, like it's it is remarkable that he had this status that he was able to unite people and um even at the worst of times he was treated separate from everybody because he was doing a good thing for both communities. It's really good that the story's been told, you know, and told by someone with the caliber of, of Don McCrae because it's, uh, he does it justice, you know, and uh, I think everyone who's speaking to Jerry, speaking to Hugh Russell and, and everybody who, who are in, included in the book, they're, they're pretty, you know, they're proud that he's done them just, justice, you know. Boxing never stopped in Belfast. At the height of the troubles, fighters from both sides trained side by side at the Holy Family Gym. Even in the Mays prison, paramilitary prisoners from both communities called on Jerry Story to start a boxing program. How the Mays came about actually would have been with the education authorities. They came out and told me that they had a problem, and the problem was that they were requested from the, the UVF, UDA, the loyalist side of the, the paramilitaries, and from the the league of the provincial ARA, and all of the RA, they were all, they were on the other side, and it seems, he said he had a strange request coming from the governor, that the prisoners on both sides had recommended me to come in and train them if I would and they were asked to use all their all their charm, if we want to call it that, for they got me to go in and train both sides. The only the only thing the only thing that I was thinking about and concerned about was why me and why the cages just after the the hunger strike. It was just finished for a couple of weeks, and uh, I would have to go up and have a talk with them. So I went up to the cages and went in, and we had a talk. Say with the like of the loyalist end of it was uh, Gusty Spence, Bobby Rogers, and the governor of the prison. They were with me. Uh, they were there. But when Bobby and Gusty came down, they insisted the governor wasn't. He wasn't to be included. They didn't want him in the cages. They wanted me. And well, I, they were as close as where we are. And the governor was as close as where we are. But whenever I spoke to them, I had to repeat everything back. To the governor, so you the I it? was a translator, and what he told me, I had to speak back to them. They weren't recognising them at all. I'm sure you must have felt a huge apprehension going in there and dealing with the likes of men like Gusty Spence or Big McFarlane and huge lead, like leaders of of both sides in, the, in this divide. Andy, to be honest, that never gave me a second thought because I, I knew what they were doing and I, I knew all about them. But I also knew what I was doing, and I didn't care. It was all the same to me. I was interested in boxing. I was interested in Belfast and the people and what they were going through, and they were going through enough. 
So we'll have to get both sides together. Like throughout the book, there's several ca- like cases where you're able to go between both sides, to cross the divide. Mm-hmm. We've almost, you know, unarmed and feel totally at ease. Mm-hmm. Were you ever afraid for your life? I know there were three, three assassination attempts on your life. Mm-hmm. But did you, did you never stop at any time and say, you know, this is dangerous? No. Never entered my head, Andy. What I'd done was, um, when, it, when, we were, when it was only starting, was to keep the boxing going. And I went up to Old Steamer Green on the shangle. He always had problems, even when there was no trouble, putting fights together. So I was going up and giving him a hand, doing the matchmaking, bringing my own kids, making sure the matches were all right, they weren't overmatched. Something would you know what you've come through yourself. And I never stopped doing it. And when the troubles, when they came the same, I, I, I still kept doing the same thing. And that was it. Never never asked anybody and never didn't seek permission or anywhere to go. Just done it. And everything was everything was hunky-dory there. Even when we did start doing that on, on the Shangle Road going up, there was a call came in that I went from the, the it came from the Loyalist Army Council, Combine what do we call combined forces, where they were concerned, and they wanted to have a meeting with me on a Sunday night. And what they did say was they would send an escort out to bring me in. And I said, no, I would go in, I'd walk in the way I always done, I'd be walking up into it, which I did. And there was a meeting, it was a good meeting. There was no problems whatsoever. The only thing I had agree, I had to agree with at the end of the meeting was that if anybody annoyed me, or anybody who had with me, or any of the teams of the boys that were with me boxing, or anything like that. If there was annoyance in any matter at all, whoever started it would be severely da- dealt with. They were more or less, <laughs> they were saying in their death warrant if there was anything. So you're like, at home on a Sunday evening, you get a call to go up and meet the, the Ulster Combined Forces. Council. Yes. Leaders of the, U, like the UDA, UVF, UFF. Yes. And you're not feeling like this is this is my last meal here. Give give your wife Belle a kiss and say <laughs> <laughs> it's been nice. It's been a nice time. You just thinking. no, it just but we'd say I dandered it up on my own and uh, picked up Jack Monica and Jack was about at the time and Jack came with me and we dandered in because remember there was nobody coming out of their homes in Belfast. There was nobody. No no other sport was going. Football was dead. All the sports. Don't want to name them, but they were all dead. Most of the clubs in Belfast, I would say, the Holy Family was the only one then would have been really opened every night of the week, and the kids were coming north, south, east, and west, all kinds. Didn't matter what their religion were, they were coming in. But for my teams, I needed to get the right competition. Andy would understand this mm-hmm. one. If we're coming up to the Commonwealth Games, I wanted any country. We could not get any country to come into Belfast. Because people were scared. They were afraid. But in the height of the troubles, you brought over two teams, Canada and then an English team. Well, th- th- that's, this is where it was coming to yeah. on that one. You're correct. But there was a guy called Recluse from Fort McMurtry in North Canada. He was the only one who would bring a team in. He rang me and asked, could I guarantee him if there was going to be peace or no trouble, would it be safe? And I said yes. He was the first. So whenever he came in, it went that well that uh, he got in touch with Dennis Belair from Edmonton in Canada. And they realized they could get to Belfast quicker than what they could to any other part of the, the big con- big cities in, in Canada. So that's a, the that's a way it started. They came in, and then we got Italy. They came in with the team, and Poland. Poland was always pretty good. So they, they were happy. They came in. But that was... But it took a year's planning, nearly for each one of them, before they would make up their mind to come over. But they were all right. And then eventually we got Freddie Barr from London. But we had a higher plane. The only deal Freddie wanted was his fighters were to get on the plane. The plane was to stand by. And if there's any trouble, back onto the plane and home. So we had to get the, we we got the plane, we booked the plane. The plane stayed at Aldergrove until the show was over. Then when the show was over the night, the day boxed, we couldn't get them out because they were having that good a time. It was social. <laughs> we couldn't get them back out to get on the plane. In the midst of all the chaos and carnage, like it's hard to quantify the actual benefit or 
the good that you have done in this gym, in the Holy Family. You know, boxing being naturally therapeutic, I suppose you're releasing an aggression and during the troubles, like that was probably so beneficial. It's not like, it's like just a, it's just hard to get your head around how many kids and young men and women you've helped and you were reeling off it early, you reeling to me earlier, like you can't count the, many, the number of Irish champions you've trained. You no, can't I count the, men of, the number of uh, Commonwealth Games medalists you've had trained and, and yeah. have won through this gym alone. Like it's how many Olympians? And I would say the club's been represented with myself included, there'd be 11 Olympians. But then again, when the kids come through that door, Andy, mm. it's, I tell them, it's the Olympic dream, and that's what you're after, and that's where you're going to go. Yeah. Well, we've been lucky enough because there's a lot of work put into them, but there's been, they've been there 11 times. Commonwealth Games, World Championships, Olympic gold, even with young Burnett, uh, you know, Paddy Barnes, you know, it's Carl great. Frampton, Tyson Carl Fury. And the list goes on and on and on. <laughs> Come in through that door. They're schooled, and they're schooled for when they're going to box for Ireland or when they go to the Olympics. Because we always tell them it's the Olympic, it's the Olympic dream. Um, as they grew up, they grew up that way. But anyway, what I can safely say was of all the internationals that have put through my hands, from Q, Sean Russell, Neil Sinclair, Paul Douglas, I'm naming them for, there's a reason. Uh, they're all mixed religion. Never once did they ever say anything in this gym about one religion or another. Now, of all the champions and the national squads we've looked after, it has never come up where they refused to go anywhere. It was always accepted. We're just sportsmen, and that's it. Incredible. Well, this story, um, it's so, as I said on the front, it's so important and it's, 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 it's amazing to read it and that knowing Jerry for all these years, never known the details of his life. And now uh, this book will be a testament to him and to the people of, of the Nov and, and, and in boxing in Nov Line during this time. So well done to both of you. Thank you very much for your time. Mm -hmm. Thank you for writing the book down. It, it will be in a legacy. It'll be a legacy for you, Jerry. And thank you for everything. No way. Um, when, when I've seen the book and looked at it and uh, thinking of what we've done and what boxing's done for, for, for Belfast and for the people in Belfast, and remember there was, a, there was a lot of them people, their families, that hadn't got any expenses or anything for the travel and leave the country. They had to live with, with it the way it happened. You know, so uh, I, th I think it's terrific and I think it's terrific that uh, the book has come out. It's one of the best I've seen. Don, and uh, what's in it, it's terrific, you know. If I could just make one point, I think which is important, is that you could have gone to the States, you had people like Billy Conn, Joe Fraser, Ray Ossell, Angelo Dundee, who all looked up to you in many ways for mm -hmm. your boxing knowledge. And I think it was Billy Conn who obviously fought Joe Lewis for the heavyweight title, he was a light heavyweight. Billy wanted you to go to the States. Listen, I think this is the best city in the world. And the people in it on both sides, they're a hundred percent. Now, if every decent guys, I'm not saying myself, there's a lot of good people out there, a lot of good people who we don't even hear about. And uh, if they were all to leave Belfast, you know, it would bring me back to what Andy you said earlier on there about me going to the states. I remember that when they were co coaxing me to stay, and they would say about the trouble that was in the states, and. Um, I was looking at their streets, and their streets, there was nobody running about them after a certain hour at night. You know, and then when you sat back and watched the problems that they were having then were drugs that we knew nothing about then. But they were having drugs and they were having all kinds of trouble in their cities. Where Belfast, we hadn't got the reasons they were using for their trouble over there. But then again, I think these are the best people in the world. and. Uh, I would never leave them, no. They'd be poor if, uh, if you did. <laughs> Not everyone was a fan of the work that Jerry was doing. He was subject to a number of threats and attempts on his life during the Troubles. He spoke to Don about these episodes. Well, the first bomb attempt was in the place what we would call Sinclair Wharf, and it was a Friday. I always liked to get away early on a Friday, 
and head to Dublin because we usually had championships or some venue was working, but it was Dublin we were headed to on a Friday. And my old, my old buddy, Yank McCann, he was with me. So we were in a place called Stormont Wharf, which is about a quarter of a mile from Sinclair Wharf. But we didn't know which one the, the, the trailer was gonna be dropped where we would load the tobacco till we got the job done. So we decided to go around to Sinclair Wharf. We went around to Sinclair Wharf. We were sitting there for about 10, 15 minutes when I got this feeling it could be back at Stormont Wharf. So we got on, we just got on the truck, drove out. Yank was sitting in the back with me, back of the truck. We drove out and before we got out through the door where we were sitting, went up in the air. There was a bomb planted at the tobacco cases beside us. So if you hadn't moved? If we hadn't moved, we would have been destroyed. We would have been killed in that one. Um, the second one, happened again in Sinclair Wharf at the top end of the wharf. And it was a day that I had promised to take Bell up to the hospital. And um, when I came home at 11.30 or 12 noon, uh, I said, she asked me to take her up. So I said, yes. But then again, done that much talking. On the phone at home, she said, Jerry, it's too late for you to take me down, to the, take me to the, the hospital. We'll have to order a taxi. So I said, look, jump in the car and come on down to me. Don't she had never been in the docks in our lives. I says, come on down to the docks for me. It'll take me 15, 20 minutes putting the load on. I'll take you straight up to the hospital, but I'll also wait until you're finished and bring you back. So she agreed. So Emma got down to the docks, but before I entered the shed, there was a guy called Billy O'Neill who worked with me at the docks, giving me a hand on the trucks. So he was running from door to door because he didn't know which opening I was going to come in through. He did spot me and I got out of the car and he's squealing, yelling, Jerry story, don't go near your truck. So I decided, right, what could you do? I got out and I said, what is it, Billy? He says, Jerry, there's a bomb under the wheel. So if that had him and off, Belle, first time ever in her life in the ducks, she could have been killed with me because the car wasn't too far from where the bomb was. The third bomb would have been after I had left the docks, went to the sports council to work. So that morning I was leaving Jerry down to the docks, the young son. And uh, he asked me to come in. He says, come on in, was what we would have said then. Come on in, Dad, for a bit of crack. I said, OK. So I went in. I'm talking to the tally man who delivers the cargo from the sheds to wherever they're going, whatever venue, whatever, wherever there it's going to be targeted, that's the way it was done. But I'm talking, as I'm talking to the tally man, Jerry's just cruising by us on the forklift when I noticed a bag, a, a sack cover just laying on, in front of the path where he'd be going down. And I knew that if I said to him, Jerry, stop to check that, he would have drove on thinking, my dad's worrying too much here. But anyway, what I did do was, I said, Billy changed the mark in here. He wants you to start it marking three instead of five or seven or whatever it was. So we reversed out in the tally man. He said to me, Jerry, have you got that feeling again? And I said, yes. I said, that sack is a different shade from the rest of the baggage that was lying about. And that was a bomb. So they went and they got whoever, the guy was swept up the shed, J Jackie McGreevy, Jackie came along. And he laughed, he said, maybe you got one of them things. And he's laughing at that stage. But at that, he did, he put the shaft of his brush just onto the sack and lifted it. Good Jesus, Jerry, he says, how did you know? And he's standing with this thing, the shaft of a brush and this bag on a bit of a bubble so we could see the bomb and all. But that filled you with anger because you could have lost your son. Well, that's... Well, what I did do, whenever we got the thing, what we done was to, we told Jackie to more or less hold, take, let the sack sink to see how far it was going to go down. If, the, if it wasn't strong enough and was going to hit the, go down on top of the bomb, we were going to be in trouble. But lucky enough, when he got it down, a couple of inches from it, he knew the, the bag was settling for a while, give us enough time to get the shaft out and get out and got the bomb squad down. And, that was that, so but when I came out that morning, I went straight up to the Shankill, 
Harry Burgess was up in Rumford Street, and on down to Harry and I said, who was a, a leader of the? He was one of them. He was the organ. He'd been one of the top men in Rumford Street with the, if you want to call them the loyalists, but. Um, Harry, when I told Harry what happened, he couldn't believe it. He says, Yeah, I can't believe this. I said, Harry, that was the third one, but it was the son. So when he realized, he said to me, We're within the docks, deep sea docks would be mainly, mainly, mainly the Protestant. I, I know that, if you want to call it, if you want to say it that way. And the deep sea would be more, mostly Catholics. 99.9 .9 both sides, you know. But anyway, and okay. you move between the two sides? I moved, I had no problem. I didn't care. I was always moving both sides anyway. But the bottom line was, where that was concerned, he said that they could control the, the cross channel, the robbers controlling the, the deep sea, and anybody could move on a red end. But he was amazed at that what had happened, but he said, leave it for him. But there was never no more bomb attempts. Do you think it was people who wanted to kill you because you were doing good work and giving peace and harmony and they didn't like that? Well, what I, well, I was disturbing what they were doing and people was in harmony on both sides. Any time I went anywhere, the crowds that was there and, and the, the, the way things was going, uh, somebody didn't want the harmony. They didn't want that at all. But each assassination attempt, it didn't impact on you. You were going to continue your work. Well, that's, as far as I was concerned, that was Belfast and this was happening. But they weren't stopping what I was doing, no.